Welcome to another episode of Tank Talks. I'm your host, Matt Cohen, and on today's show, we welcome the former co-founder of OkCupid and SparkNotes, Sam Yegan, to discuss why you should always be open to new ideas and opportunities. Sam shares his journey starting SparkNotes, the first online Coles Notes competitor in his Harvard dorm room with his two college mates, and how he ended up selling the company to Barnes & Noble several years later. Next, we dig into Sam's journey launching OkCupid during his Stanford MBA years and how that business went head-to-head with industry leaders like Match Group, led by the famous Barry Diller of IAC. Sam opens up about how he never wanted to sell to Match, but he knew it was his only viable exit given his size and ads-based business model. Sam explains why he was tasked with becoming the CEO of Match Group without having any real CEO experience, and how he accomplished the unthinkable by acquiring their biggest competitor, Plenty of Fish, during his leadership of the company. Lastly, we discuss the reason why Sam decided to launch Corazon Capital as a leading Chicago venture capital fund to help Midwest entrepreneurs get access to the same kind of investors as the ones on the coast. But before we jump into this week's interview with Sam Yegan, we welcome back to the tank John Ruffalo to discuss the news and stories making headlines in the tech and venture capital ecosystem. Welcome back to the tank, John. Always great to have you in the hot seat. You know, right now I want to just kick off things with what's going on with Reno Run. We saw that the court extension was granted as they're still trying to find a buyer. Given your background in, you know, accounting and working uh, in the industry for so long, it would be great to maybe share with our audience exactly how these insolvency processes work and how the courts sort of try to manage the process, but there's a trustee, in this case Deloitte, trying to also help run a sales process. And it says, based on updates in the media, that there was 20 parties interested <laughs> uh, and 17 had signed their NDAs, which we all know you know, in the industry doesn't mean anything and how many of those NDAs actually move through to final close. But just maybe explain to our audience like why Run Run is trying to throw a Hail Mary here and what they hope to maybe get out of this. Well, they have an obligation and they have a moral obligation to get some money back to the people who trusted them. But remember, you know, when the trustee is in, who gets paid first? The trustee, right? So the trustee is going to make sure that uh, that they get the money first, which is, you know, what all of them then do. And if there's money left over, it's going to go to the preferred stack. But people who come in on those... 90 plus percent of them are just curious folks and maybe there's an opportunity to to you know buy something for nothing but the part that i just don't know is in a marketplace type of business what could be the resultant intangible value whether it's customers like who what there's zero value and IP in what? In a marketplace? I don't think so. So I don't see what's really here. But you know what? Throw a lifeline and maybe the maybe somebody actually wants uh, wants something there. But I, I do struggle who a buyer would be. Yeah, you're buying either trucks leases or, you know, uh, uh, warehouse leases and all that stuff. Some of the hard the hard uh, equipment stuff that I see some value in. Yes, I agree. Potentially, but yeah, agreed. It's just like in the FTX debacle, you know, the lawyers and the uh, insolvency trustees are getting paid quite handsomely before anyone else sees uh, 10 cents on the dollar from that. So uh, always when people see the headlines that 20 people are interested, maybe one would actually make it to the final innings before nothing ends up getting done. But I digress here. I got to get your take on this, John. I think it's uh, it's a, a bit of a, a crapshoot here with the CRA and all the Public Service Alliance of Canada members voting with their feet in the real world to work remotely. I don't know. It's very strange to hear people who want to work from their basements leaving their homes to vote to stay home. It just proves that not everyone has the luxury of doing their jobs from a computer. And therefore, why should they, working for the public, which majority of the public may not be able to, be able to do this? I I have to ask for your take on this. Oh, man, you're going to get me into trouble with so many folks. I don't want to get you into trouble on this specific (laughs) topic, but I find it just interesting that people still have to get up in the morning to vote or to, to, you know, vote with their feet and be on a picket line to do something that's unable to be done that way. Well, I think that tells, it tells you everything. Let me tell you a different story and it tells you everything. We start off in saying the majority of workers have no choice. They're frontline workers. And a lot of white collar folks are arrogant 
in not realizing that there's only about a third of folks that actually have this flexibility. And then I will bifurcate those folks who you really don't understand why they're doing their jobs in an office, say a call center employee. There's a grouping of those. So let's talk about those folks where they could and should be doing work, or at least some portion of their work, in an office environment. And this is part of the story. When I was asking a question of a company where the employees were absolutely said, if I go into the office, and this was during COVID, I'm basically risking my life and I'm going to die if I show up in the office. And the office was a hoteled space. And the capacity utilization from Monday through Wednesday was something like, let's call it 10%. Thursdays, you couldn't get a desk. And you'd say, well, what? why was so special on Thursdays? Well, they had disproportionately young folks who wanted to go out to the bars on Thursday. So there, they're not risking their lives. This is the same thing, in my view, where folks are saying, we shouldn't be in the office, but yet we'll go physically and... Uh, to the hockey game in the arena and spend time with 35,000 fans. Exactly. and Or go shopping or what have you. We, we all know what's really going on. Right. We all know what's really going on. We all know the benefits of working from home and not having commute. And you're right. A lot of frontline healthcare workers, you know, my wife's, you know, working in healthcare. She can't work from home. And, and unfortunately, that's the career path they have. So that this is the problem, though, that I have. And the biggest problem is they're opening up a can of worms for something that is obviously going to be discussed, which is how many types of technology can replace the amount of calls per week and the amount of tax returns that are being reviewed and audited and things like that to not have to uh, substitute somebody to be able to work from home. And I think that's the problem is that they're opening up that conversation faster than they want it to. uh, And it's going to backfire on them. I mean, the, the wage increases, I have no problem with. I think it's absolutely adequate for them to ask for that, given the circumstances of the inflation argument. But I think what we're doing right now is we're putting a lot of the back burner conversations of what technology can do to replace a lot of the inefficiencies in the tax and public service system on the front uh, page right now for people to actually consider seriously because of the arguments they're putting forward. Right. And I would love to hear a productivity argument. And if it is a productivity argument... Absolutely. But show me the data. Don't show me the preference that you like to work in your pajamas. Is that the issue? And that's what the public perception is. And they've done a horrible job on getting the public to support whatever, you know, the the particular issues that they have. Yeah. So moving on to, you know, discussing a little bit more of the layoffs happening. We hear about all the layoffs happening in the public markets, in the private markets, obviously with tech companies. But one thing that's starting to pop up more and more is how the layoffs are coinciding with more AI-powered initiatives replacing the labor at companies. And I wanted to get your take on how you're seeing companies really try to increase the productivity of those 10x engineers, those 10x customer service support staff, while letting go of the 1x kind of support people and replacing those with AI tools that increase their productivity and efficiency. Yeah, so this is the debate that you know I've been having actually over the last ten years, and which has been giving me big anxiety. As a as an investor shareholder, you're putting the pressure on your companies to be bigger, faster, better, stronger, and improving productivity. What is the number one thing that you hear that is the problem with Canada? It's productivity, not innovation, but productivity, which is simply a mathematical formula of replacing human labor with machine labor. So that's fine. But then you start to look at the ramifications. And then I get accused of being a Luddite and saying, but John, since the Industrial Revolution, this has gone on. Yes, it has. But it's taking generations for that replacement effect to occur. I was reading something saying, do you remember the good old days when Apple would release a new phone every two years? And we thought that was crazy fast. And now we're expecting, you know, uh, chat GPT to get their new model in a week. 
Well, the problem is the dislocation of human labor is going to happen at an unprecedented speed. And for a lot of these folks, they cannot be retrained in time. So the problem is, where does the economic value ultimately go? And before it used to go to wages. And now when you no longer have wages, because it's now investment in equipment, software, et cetera, how do you distribute those profits out to the masses? And this is when you start getting into those discussions of a basic in- income concept, because I don't know of a whole lot of better ideas at this point, to be honest. It's true. I, I, it's a quite dystopian view of the world, but I do believe that with more machines being able to increase productivity for uh, economies and companies, it ends up going back into the owner's pockets. And when I mean owners, you're talking about shareholders, stakeholders, and obviously investors. And unfortunately, as less you know dollars go to the wages because you don't need to support that staff, it becomes quite dystopian of what those people end up doing living you know, on this planet with their day-to-day routine. It's quite sad. So speaking of layoffs, so uh, uh, something that hasn't really been talked about in our industry is the layoffs at the venture capital or investor level. We saw recent news uh, that Anthemis Group cut 28% of their staff, which is a fintech investment fund. Y Combinator did about 20% of their layoffs some weeks ago. But, you know, we did see a lot of firms get quite bloated during the last bull market because they raise bigger funds. Therefore, you need bigger staff and bigger platform presence. Do you think we're going to start to see more layoffs at the investment GP level? Yes, but not so much in Canada that we'll be able to recognize it because we were never raising large, massive funds. I mean, who's got the biggest platform team in Canada? Probably Georgian. Right. So so what's going to be the impact of a dozen layoffs or instead of a layoff, it will just be, you know what, we're going to lose some folks. Let's just not replace them. But you heard about, you saw a tiger when they're dropping 20% fund size. Well, that's a billion dollars or at least on one of the funds. It's going to trickle down. They've lost a number of their partners. And I think it's going to be those funds that exploded really rapidly, number one. Number two, it's those that have very significant disproportionate value creation teams, because there is a real debate in the industry. Do they really create the value that VCs purport that they do, number one? And number two, there's two types of models. There is, you have a very focused team that's highly strategic or you do the Andreessen Horowitz, we're building a recruiting firm with hundreds of folks. And I think those two models may give way to greater layoffs in one of those models versus the other. Yeah. I mean, the VC industry exploded over the last decade. I saw a stat that in 2007, there was 987 VC firms, but by 2021, there were 2.9 million. I, I I don't believe the number almost. I think it's probably a lot of- 2.9 million firms? That's what it said. There were 2.9 million of which were raising money last year, according to the NVCA, National Venture Capital Association. I think that probably includes a lot of rolling funds, angel funds, side hustle funds as well. But nonetheless, let's just say the number went from 1,000 to tens of thousands. It's still crazy. There was a lot of bifurcation in the industry as well, where a lot of the bigger players had their, you know, junior senior partners spread off and start their own, you know, secondary third tier funds. So yeah, uh, we have to see consolidation of some signs, but um, you know, we also see the, the rippling effect of uh, SVB still playing out in the industry uh, with first Republic. I mean, it's seeing a lot of the aftermath and what I still can't fathom is how fucking stupid the management team was at first Republic and how they couldn't get in front of this while they saw it happening in front of their eyes with SVB and then see $100 billion of deposits get totally wiped off their balance sheet. And they still cannot make up because they have money coming in from all the banks that supported them, included in, in whatever they have left. Uh, and now you're uh, stuck in this you know double-edged sword with the FDIC. They're taking the, the brunt of it with a $30 billion hit. Or the banks having to step up, and you know, this week the uh, the Fed says and the regulators say they're not going to step in and save this one. So, how do you think this one plays out? Yeah, because I I don't know who's more stupid, 
uh, the bank or or FDIC. FDIC stupidly blocked the large deposit taking institutions from coming in. Frankly, if they didn't, the potential fear and run would have likely have stopped. And the thing that's really stupid is by them still trying to manipulate the market by having a regional bank come in, the customers ignored it and took their money out. And not only did they take SVB's money out, they took first with them. And now the deposit increases, by the way, and not only in the large U.S. banks, but the large Canadian ones got a big pop, too. So this is why lots of folks are remaining very quiet, because it's been a very good thing if you are a large bank. I know. I don't believe the conspiracy theories that, you know, Jamie Dimon and all them were kind of like spearheading this. I think they're just taking advantage of the situation, which, you know, everyone should be in a situation like, you know, when things fall apart in your industry. But what I still can't fathom is how the regulators can't foresee how the contagion is still not contained because of the commercial real estate crisis and how tied commercial real estate is to the regional banking industry. And if you let these banks fail, you're going to see a cascade across the commercial industry, uh, real estate, and then that's going to take a lot of the economy with it. So do you know what the, some of the, 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 the biggest piece of news that I read over the past, I, I want to say two weeks ago, that got almost no coverage? Brookfield handed the keys on three buildings in the United States. This is Brookfield, an outstanding asset manager. And I have been told that there is going to be a whole slew of giving back and these mortgages. And they're basically just say, they're just doing the smart thing. And who knows their other arms are going to come up and pick up uh, the pieces on here, but that is going to cause a number of regional banks to be very, very unshaky. Yes, it is quite uh, scary to know that now the market is actually seeing transactions that people were saying, everyone was just seeing on the sidelines. But as soon as the market actually has a transaction that sets the new bar, uh, it starts to mark everyone else's asset books down. Their book value gets marked down to fair market value, which is quite scary. You know, last thing before I let you go, John, the SpaceX satellite la- or a Starship launch was successful among everyone of the industry experts. However, the media still portrayed it as a failure and the headlines were just terrible to watch. What the hell is going on? So, you know, what's funny, but funny you mentioned that. So when I first read it and I was really excited about it and then I I was Googling, you know, just to get more insights and I wanted to find some video. Well, all of the headlines were it was a disaster and it blew up and another failure for Elon Musk. And I was like, holy shit, how did I miss this? And then I finally see it. And then I hear the people and you can hear the the audio of the folks in the mission control that were cheering because it achieved what they at least needed to achieve. Of course, they didn't want it to blow up and make a mess over the Gulf, but it was very, very valuable. People are just trying to really go after this guy again. And Elon responds quite uh, childish in many occasions, but Jesus Christ, like let the technology and, 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 and some of the stuff that he's doing, like, like congratulate these folks for what they're trying to do for the world. And yet you get, uh, you know, media forces uh, that are just no matter what he does, they're hoping that Tesla blows up. They're hoping that Twitter blows up. It's just ridiculous. But, you know, the reality is maybe they're appeasing a certain audience of theirs. But for folks like you and I who just care about the technology, the success, it just emboldens us to make sure that we don't even pay attention to those rags anyway. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's clickbait. It's people trying to get, you know, whatever attention they can to their websites without actually peeling back the, you know, first layer of what actually happened here and what technology went into being built to succeed at this launch. I mean, first off, it was a wasteland that they took off the Gulf of Mexico coast in Texas and turned it into a functioning city essentially, and built an entire ecosystem for people to build this stuff and then successfully have a launch that's going to change, obviously, our world, but also our, our, our kids' future and the way that costs are being reduced by thousands of percent 
Yeah. Wouldn't you love to mine for lithium on a uh, another planet and not destroy ours? Like, wouldn't that be would that be good? Is that not a good thing? That or just having like fiber optic type of download speed across our country? Like, come on! <laughs> like, I don't even care about mining on the world. Just giving us better. Yeah, I think the Ukrainians are pretty pleased uh, on the connectivity that he's providing. Don't you think? Uh, you know, so not everyone in the world is uh, is uh, down on him. But anyways, it's 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 amu- it's amusing. There's always news for us to talk about on the News Rundown Show. So thanks again for joining us, John. (laughs) All right. Thank you. Now let's jump into the tank for this week's episode with Sam Yagen from Corazon Capital. Thanks for joining us in the tank today, Sam. Hi, Matt. Thanks for having me. You know, Sam, you've been in and around the startup tech ecosystem for quite some time. But for some of our listeners who may not be familiar with your background, it'd be great to kick things off with a little bit about your journey and how you made your way into the startup ecosystem and how your Syrian immigrant background helped help shape you and how you ended up becoming such a prolific entrepreneur. Well, I'm not sure I've reached prolific yet, but uh, I have been doing it for a long time. My, uh, my kids always remind me that the 1900s were uh, the century of the horse and buggy. So that was uh, my first startup was back in the 90s. I was uh, born to Syrian immigrants uh, who came over in the 70s um, you know, with the dream of pursuing a better life for their, for their yet unborn kids. I was born uh, in the Chicago area. And had a relatively lovely upbringing. I was, uh, you know, really good at, at math. I uh, went to a, you know, fancy math and science school for high school through what I can't really ascribe to any other than luck, got into uh, Harvard for my undergrad. So after being super lucky to be, even be born in the United States and then super lucky uh, to get to, um, you know, go to this really amazing high school called the Illinois Math and Science Academy, I showed up at Harvard my very first day of school and got even luckier when I met this guy, Max, and this guy, Chris, who one Max was my roommate, Chris lived across the hall. And I don't know what the freshman dean's office was thinking when they made the roommate pairings. And I don't, don't know if they you know, had an algorithm or it was random. But um, those two guys, Max and Chris, ended up being, uh, to this day, two of my best friends and ended up being my, uh, my first co-founders uh, when we started SparkNotes in um, spring of 1999. There was nothing particularly entrepreneurial about my childhood. People ask, did you have a lemonade stand? Did you have a paper route? Talk about an anachronistic concept of a paper route. But, and, and the answer is no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do those things. I wasn't particularly drawn to sort of the traditional definition of, of entrepreneurship. I, I will say that being a son of immigrants instill a certain comfort with risk and a certain long term view about life that I don't think I really appreciated until I started to dissect some of the decisions I had made. I mean, if you think about entrepreneurship, it's in some ways the old, if you think about immigration, it's in some ways the ultimate entrepreneurship. It's, you know, giving up what you know and what you're comfortable with and these sort of relative certainties for this huge unknown. Um, and in many ways, and, and if, if your lottery ticket hits, it can be great, but there's huge risk. And in many ways, that, that profile, that shape is very similar to you know, what a founder faces um, or an entrepreneur faces. And so if I fast forward t- to the late 90s, uh, the, Max and Chris and I were, were all in college. Really, I have to give, you know, Chris the credit. And he, he back then and, and to this day was always someone who was very uh, curious about technology, very curious about uh, how humans think and interact. And one of the nice things about the late 90s is – the internet was so young. We were so early in the evolution of the internet that in some ways there were still very obvious ideas that hadn't been done yet. Yeah, you know, I think about today with generative AI or with blockchain, like these are truly novel concepts, like from from the bottom up. And if you think about SparkNotes, which was our first startup, I mean Cliff's Notes had existed for 50 years, right? And really all SparkNotes did was said, oh, these study guides that we now that we have always known as Cliff's Notes, why doesn't somebody just write a new set of study guides and put them on the internet? Like compared to what you know you've got to do today to start a company, that feels so quaint. You know, it, it feels so simple. And so we're sitting around in, in Chris's dorm room and we were thinking about different ideas. Chris had already been dabbling with putting websites up just sort of very uh, informally. I remember Max looking at some some Cliff's Notes that Chris had had on his shelf. And Max saying, has anyone put Cliff's Notes online yet? It's one of those ideas that 
we didn't even do any market research. We did, it was such, it was so obviously the right thing to happen. It had to happen. And we were sitting on a college campus with all these, you know, brilliant English majors. It was very easy to find the first set of Sparknotes writers. And I think whenever people talk about startups and, and especially with respect to the internet, it, it's all very specific to the point in time that you were operating. I mean, the three of us getting together in 1999 versus 2009 versus 2019 would have yielded very different outcomes. I think we were just at a point in time where more than anything, what you needed was that that activation energy, that willingness to go from zero to one. Hey, I have an idea. Someone should put Cliffsos online to let's do it. And that was, I think, something that the three of us really had. And and that's what got us going. Yeah. You keep referring back to sort of like you know, dumb luck or luck was just always in your favor. But I really I, I have to believe that like your parents going on that very first startup journey as immigrants truly is the most risky type of startup experience. You know, yes, they were successful, obviously, in getting to the United States and allowing you to have the upbringing you did. But, you know, how much during your life did you really believe in luck or was it instilled in hard work that led you to where you are today? Like you must have worked pretty hard. It wasn't just lucky at the right place at the right time all the time. Life is a series of probabilistic outcomes, right? Like you could, I could have gotten in a car accident coming to work today. I could have, you know, like you're always dealing with these, with these uncertainties. So the way I think about it is things like hard work, things like taking care of your health, whatever they are, those are all ways that you're just constantly shifting the odds more, just ever so slightly more in your favor. And so, yeah, like if you just sit in your basement all day and, you know, and eat potato chips, you're, you're not maximizing the chance that you get lucky, right? You're, you're, you could still get lucky. You could play the lottery and, and win, you know, a million dollars. But what I have done throughout my life as, as well as I can, and what I try, have tried to instill in my, my own kids is, you know, what you're trying to do is you're trying to do all the work to prepare yourself to get lucky, to maximize the chance that you get lucky. When I hear people who are successful talk about their success and not attribute at least some of it to, hey, I was in the right place at the right time. I met the right person. I, I don't know. That to me is is hard. I, I'm sure there are people who don't need luck and they're just brilliant. But for me, it's always been, let's do everything we can to maximize the probability that, that you know, the chips fall our way. And, you know, but then when they don't, you also can't take that too hard. You can't beat yourself up too much when unlucky things happen. You know, when things don't go your way, you just have to get back up and that's this concept of always being okay to fail. And that's another thing that, you know, my parents, you know, I, I remember my mom saying all the time, just never give up, you know, no, no matter what has happened, whatever your setback is, that's fine. You just have to get back up and keep going. Yeah. For a lot of immigrants too, don't make it the first time they have to keep trying. Right. And so like it's, uh, it starts from the very beginning of them trying to get to the, the, the place they want to end up to start a better life. But, you know, you mentioned meeting Max and Chris, your uh, co-founders at Harvard uh, of Sparknotes, and you gave up on your consulting dreams, I believe, to go start your first startup. But you also had a pretty quick exit to Barnes & Noble for $3.6 million in 2001. You know, what was the impact of that startup and, and quick exit to Barnes & Noble that changed your views on how to create a business versus a quick tech startup? Uh, it was actually a little bit more nuanced than that. Uh, the 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 Sale to Barnes and Noble was actually the second sale of the company. We had a, we had a, we had sold the company prior to that. So we started the company in March of 99. And by September, when the school year started, we had, we had launched the, the first hundred spark notes and the site was taking off like crazy. I mean, it was, you know, yeah, as you can imagine, if you were a student and you just discovered that there are free study guides, like that was, it was an amazing run. And by October of that year, we had started getting some companies interested in acquiring us. And uh, the first sale was actually to a company called iTurf. And that was a $30 million transaction. What you can imagine is three, we were a team of 11 by that time, but three college friends working for less than a year. And, you know, the opportunity to make $30 million is as a 23 year old is a pretty crazy concept. You know, we, we did the deal. We ended up, the company that bought us ended up going bankrupt um, and that's why there was the second sale um, to Barnes & Noble just a year later. Uh, the reason it was for so much less is because the market had crashed. Uh, the the dot the dot com collapse had happened in the meantime, and so the the sale was was much cheaper. And we can talk a lot about that. That was probably my biggest mistake in business. Uh, my, my my biggest professional mistake was probably not 
buying Spark Notes back when um, when when Barnes and Noble bought it from iTurf. But let's talk about that. So iTurf obviously gave you, I assume, equity in their like it was know, a mix. Yep. Yeah, cash and equity. Okay. You obviously thought the equity would continue to go. It didn't. And then how did the transaction though with Barnes and Noble get kind of consummated? Was it you and your team that were at the helm of it, or was it iTurf that was controlling that? I'll, I'll spare you all the details, but there was basically a clause in our contract with iTurf that made they, they owed us a bunch of money. Let's let's keep it simple. Uh, they owed us a bunch of money, and they came to us one day and said, "Hey, instead of giving you the rest of your money, why don't we go try to sell Spark Notes and we'll split whatever we make from that transaction?" And there was a bunch of other stuff going on at the time, so we said, "Sure, no problem." So we went to try to sell it, and you know, this was um, early two thousand one. I mean, as as bad as the market for you know tech companies. That was the bottom. And so none of the tech acquirers were interested. And it was just Barnes Noble, which at the time, you know, wasn't even running its own website, I don't think. And they were interested in the actual physical books. They wanted to print Spark Notes and put them in stores. And to this day, that is, you know, that is a big part of their, uh, of the Spark Notes business model. And I remember when we ran the process and we got the bids and, you know, Barnes Noble was, was the bid we were going to take. And I remember thinking, we just made all this money from iTurf a year earlier. They're about to give us 1.8 million. If instead of taking that 1.8 million, we just give them 1.8 million, we can actually buy Sparknotes back and own it. And I mean, if you think about it, it's the equivalent of like just someone handing you a bunch of money because you still have your company at the end. I mean, it, 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 it's a crazy, it was in retrospect, such a no brainer to do. At the time though, Sparknotes was losing money. I had no confidence in, in our ability to raise venture capital because honestly, we hadn't, we only raised $250,000. I was a kid. I was 24, I guess at the time, 23 at the time. And I was scared. And we probably would have had to fire people. I'd never, I didn't know how to fire people. That seemed, that seemed terrible. And honestly, and this is going to sound terribly unvisionary. I don't know if we knew when the internet was coming. And so I think we were like, well, wait a minute. If we buy this company back, it's going to be losing money. We're going to have to fire everybody. And what if we're just stuck with it kind of forever? And in retrospect, um, especially when people, you know, use words like visionary and all these like very flattering words to describe, to describe us or to, to describe me, I'm always like, when we really had a chance to make a really bold move, we kind of, we kind of screwed up. You know, we just did. We, we, we didn't pull the trigger. And I just think, I mean, if, you, if you're under 35 in the United States, there's a 95% chance you know what spark notes are. Like spark notes are ubiquitous among people who grew up in the, in the 2000s. And to own that brand, to have been able to own that brand for $1.8 million and to be able to launch, I mean, when we ended up launching OkCupid down the road, imagine launching it to an audience of millions of people on spark notes. We just could have done so much. It would have accelerated all of our future entrepreneurial plans, but we didn't even plan to be entrepreneurs again. We were just kids who had sort of stumbled onto this idea. And so we didn't have the the long-term vision and strategy even for our own careers. We didn't even think of it as a career. We thought of it as like a thing that we did. That is by far the biggest professional mistake I've ever made was um, was not buying SparkNotes back in 2001. You know, it's interesting to hear you say that because I always am fascinated when I hear stories of entrepreneurs who sell businesses, they crumble under the new ownership, and then they buy them back for like a penny or a dollar. I honestly am going to create a podcast just about people who've sold businesses and then bought them back because it happens so many times. But the nuances that happen in between are so interesting and fascinating that I think we need to do a podcast on it. So thank you for sharing that. But I think there's something that you probably didn't mention in why you didn't want to do this. I think $1.8 million to buy your own business back was a lot of money. If they would have said, hey, give us 150 grand and let us have like 10% or something, you mu- you probably would have done it. So there was like a real cash portion to it. Fast forward to what's happening today in the market though, Sam, there's probably a lot of founders who still believe in their product and their business, but they've you know obviously sunk too much capital into it that they can't actually you know, get their common equity out of it. You know, What if they were able to go out to people like you and said, hey, Sam, I want to buy my own business back from my investors and I'll offer them like, 10 cents on the dollar. 
and we'll own this thing. That's a model that I think is actually going to happen now. I think there are a lot of businesses that founders would want to take private. <laughs> like they're already like small kind of d- zombie companies, but there's something there and they just want to buy the IP back. That is a business that I think actually exists now. I, I think you're 100% right. I've actually uh, started thinking about how to operationalize that. It, it's it's tricky. It's, it's, an, it's a very, the way I've described it is businesses that have clear product market fit, but have broken cap tables. What, one of the major ways it's manifested is a company that, you know, raised it too high valuation, did, weren't able to grow into that, into that valuation, have all this preference on their cap table, and then they can't raise more money. The investors lose interest. I've seen some companies where the investors just resign from the board. They're like, don't even call me. I'm not on the board anymore. And the founders left, they can't even get anything done because the investors aren't going to approve anything that hurts their economic position. And is there this opportunity? I think the real question becomes when the founder starts to show interest in their business, do those investors say, wait a minute, why am I, why, why am I selling, you know, for 10 cents on the dollar, you know, or whatever. So I do think it's, it's a little bit trickier, but I think a lot of investors are willing to say, look, either for their reputation or because their heart's in the right place, I don't want to thwart this entrepreneur from being able to pursue their passion. And so if there's an easy way for me to get out of the way, maybe give me some upside if things work out, but um, I'm willing to take the write off. I think some investors are willing to do that. Part of it, we've seen it happen. I think it's easier when you're not a part of the company. Obviously, as an existing shareholder trying to do that with the CEO, it's, it becomes very convoluted. But listen, we'll save that for another podcast, you know? Okay, that's that's two. We've got two new ones coming. We've got two new ones. So after SparkNotes, you created OkCupid while getting your MBA at Stanford. First off, congratulations. That's the coolest thing ever uh, to be able to say you created the OkCupid, one of the first fastest online dating sites, you know? But what drove you to start OkCupid? And how did you change the way you thought about building OkCupid? Cupid versus your prior startup at eDonkey and SparkNotes, and what were some of the lessons you learned that you applied to OKCupid okay after experiencing those two startups? So, so we had always been interested in online dating. Even when we were running SparkNotes, we had hired a summer intern to build something called Spark Match, which no one's ever heard of. It was a tiny little thing, but we we had always been interested in just how technology would change the way people interact with each other. That was just very much at the core of everything we were doing. Even at SparkNotes, one of the things we were fascinated by was how people would share, even before like sharing was a thing on social media, like could we get people to tell their friends about an online experience they were having at SparkNotes? So we've just always been thinking about the consumer that way. The way we started OkCupid was um, my co-founder, Chris, had an idea for a a dating site. And, you know, he called me late one night. Uh, he was at a bar on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. It was late one night and uh, called me and pitched me this idea. I won't go into all the details. It wasn't exactly okay, Cupid, but it was a, it was a derivative. I thought he was just having a fun night and had an idea. So I kind of wrote it off. I went to sleep and then Chris called me the next morning and said, so what do you think? And I was like, think about what? And he's like, my idea. And I was like, you're not serious, are you? And he's like, no, no, we're totally going to do this. And so this was in this was in November, December of 2002. You know, unlike SparkNotes, which I said earlier, we kind of instantly knew, hey, like, let's get started tomorrow. I think with OkCupid, we wanted to be a lot more thoughtful about what what is this thing we're going to build? How are we going to build it? And so we, the three of us, plus our fourth co-founder, Christian, we got together. We had lunch a couple times a week for the next few months. And really just started thinking through, you know, unlike SparkNotes, which was this, no one was doing it. It was just a market that was just, we could just take. Online dating, although it was still very small compared to where we, where the, where the industry is today, with Match, Any Harmony did have two major incumbents who were, you know, much bigger, of course, than we were, given that we were just starting. And so it was much more important, I think, for us to think competitively about how we were going to differentiate the product vis-a-vis the guys that were already in there. And so that was a big part of the the difference. We're going to have a much more well-thought-out plan, I think, on how we're going to build this thing. We thought a little bit differently about how to fundraise for it. So unlike at SparkNotes, where we literally, it was Max's dad's friend who funded us. Here, we actually you know had somewhat of our own network of people that we could go to to raise capital uh, and we had our own capital to put into the business. So we financed it differently. We sort of planned for it differently. 
you know, the thing we couldn't plan for was, or, or the thing we, we, we didn't plan for was certainly how much harder it would be to build a dating business um, against two in, entrenched competitors than it was to build an education company uh, against no competitors. And there's a lot of dynamics why that turned out to be true. But whereas it basically took us eight months to sell SparkNotes, it took us eight years to sell OkCupid. So that I think in itself just sort of explains how difficult and how different it was. But your your description of how you went about starting OkCupid is exactly the way kind of first-time founders and second-time founders always go about solving their next startup because they have bright eye, bushy tail coming out of university with an idea or still in university, like you were at Harvard, and you're just like moving fast and breaking things and worrying about all the other fires to put out later. But with OkCupid, you're a little bit more mature, a little bit more present in sort of what the situation was today with the competitive landscape and worrying about that and how are you going to attack it from a different vector. It's exactly like how second time and third time founders today, you know, 20 years later are still thinking about starting their next business that I see. But you're, as you mentioned, it took eight months to sell SparkNotes and eight years to sell uh, OkCupid. But in February 2011, you sold uh, OkCupid to Match Group one of your biggest competitors for $50 million. And OkCupid was the first free uh, advertising-based product uh, that Match Group added to that portfolio. But you also spent another seven years as head of Match Group, which also includes OkCupid, Match.com, and eventually Tinder. You know, what were some of the biggest challenges and opportunities you experienced during your time leading one of the largest online dating platforms? When you sell your company, especially to a much larger company, it's so hard to predict what's going to happen. And I've had two, I've had two such experiences and they couldn't have been more opposite. When we sold OkCupid to match and we had spent the last three years, I mean, really the last eight years, but especially the last three years, just hating match. I mean, we hated them internally. We, we wrote blog posts just eviscerating their ad campaigns and eviscerating like their product. And we were just like, we were just like at war with match. And so to then get in bed with match was, um, I have to say when we were having our conversations as founders, are we going to sell to match? There was a real, at least one voice in the room was just convinced it was going to end in litigation. One of my co-founders was like, he said, there's a literally a hundred percent probability that we end up suing each other. So what was interesting was like, as, as part of our deal, there was a pretty big earnout. So this is pretty, this is common in, um, in these kinds of transactions. So for the first year, we were just heads down, hit our numbers and, and we could basically double the value of the company by having a really good first year. So we were just laser focused. So we all plan on spending a year and then getting out of there. What I have to just give so much credit to, to IAC, you know, they came to us proactively midway through that first year and said, look, you guys can add so much more value to this company than just focusing on hitting your earn out. How do we think about a way to get you guys to stay longer than just one year? We said, look, you know, we're having a great time. You're, you're, you're giving us all the autonomy in the world to, to pursue OkCupid. And they didn't, Match didn't make us change anything. They just let us build a great product. In fact, I would argue 2011, 2011 is, is probably one of the best years of OkCupid. If you go back and look at the whole run, that first year while we were part of Match was maybe when we were hitting on all cylinders the best. And so that was great. So we were so Max and Chris and Christian and I all agreed to, you know, to stay longer. And then in that second year, the CEO of IEC at the time was this guy named Greg and you know, he basically started saying, Sam, why don't you just start taking on more responsibility? And first he said, why don't you run all of the ad sales within Match Group? So because OkCupid was the only business that where ads was the primary part of the business, but all the other businesses ran ads, ads as well. So he said, Sam, why don't you just build an ad sales group? So I built an ad sales group. And then, you know, Greg came to me one day and said, you know, how would you feel about being the CEO of Match Group? You know, in terms of a, just a career changing moment, I was like a startup guy. Like I had never run an org more than 30 people. Like the, okay, okay, I'm, like everyone knows SparkNotes and everyone knows OKQ, but they were small companies and they were relatively small businesses. And I remember saying to Greg, like, I'm not qualified for this job. You know, I don't know any, I don't, Match had a big international business. Match had a big marketing component. Match was a big subscription business. Like Match was 
basically a public company. It was inside of IAC, but it was still, you know, had to hit quarterly numbers. I was like, I haven't done any of that stuff. I said, well, why me? And he's like, well, I I think you have the ability to lead and the ability to innovate and the ability to, you know, build culture. In September of 2012, I went from running overnight, I went from running a 30 person org to a thousand person org. And that put my entire career and put my entire everything, my mindset just on a very different trajectory. And so for the next three years, I was the CEO of Match Group. Uh, which included the incubation and growth of Tinder inside of Match. And we acquired a bunch of companies, including Plenty of Fish, which was uh, uh, the lar- at the time was the largest uh, acquisition uh, of, a, of a dating business. And then we eventually went public in 2015, which all were opportunities I just never would have imagined having uh, when we signed that, that deal to, to be acquired by Match. I love those stories too. When you're like a tiny little acquisition inside a conglomerate like IAC, and then you end up becoming leading the charge of a go public, you know, massive online platform. You know, how did you deal with imposter syndrome, uh, knowing you yourself as an operator, but not qualified as a CEO? I mean, imposter syndrome, I think is like an everyday occurrence for, for me. It's, uh, I constantly find myself in situations that I'm unqualified for, unprepared for, um, I find myself earning recognition and, and honors and making all these lists of things that I, I just know I'm only there because I have been working with and around so many amazing people. And I happen to be the title of CEO. Like my co-founders, Max and Chris Christian are like, I tell my kids and they're like, I'm like, they are way smarter and way more talented than me. I happen to have, none of them want to be CEO. Like I happen to have a certain set of skills that complement theirs that in the way we organize businesses happens to be the top job. I I think throughout the history, throughout OkCupid, I felt really, I had moments regularly that, you know, all three of my co-founders were adding so much more value. And I was like, I feel imposter syndrome, uh, inadequate, whatever. And then I think one of my moments, especially in, with that group, was um, when we sold the company to Match, I really led that negotiation. And again, with the support of my co-founders, I don't ever want to say I did it on my own. But I think I led a process with Match that got Match to pay a way more for the business than they had planned to when they first started talking to us. And so if I think about the, you know, we ended up selling for $90 million. And so if I sort of, if you get just very transactional about it and you just say like, okay, how do you attribute value to each of the co-founders of that total bucket? I was like, okay, I think I can, I I think I might've gotten close to a quarter of that value. Even if it was just in a 90 day run at the end, you know, out of the eight years, but I, I did feel like I contributed value at the end. And I think that was a big moment for me just really realizing the way people add value can be very different and disparate. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to look the same and feel the same all the way through. And that it's okay if my value is very behind the scenes, very sort of providing support for, and really not doing anything that seemed particularly valuable for a long time, but then really adding value at the end. Like that was a, that was something that was a turning point for me being like, okay, you're still going to feel imposter syndrome, but you're going to, but you can at least point to a couple places where you have added value that you can, that that's tangible. Yeah, absolutely. I think like, first off, it's like in the army, if you're not on the front lines, but you're sitting back, uh, you know, in the, in the office, kind of scouring a bunch of data and looking for the bad guys in the place, but you don't do anything for a long time. And all of a sudden in one minute, you turn the entire tide towards your team side because you found the bad person friend potentially ending somebody else's life. That's incredibly valuable. And I'm not trying to compare your negotiation with match to an, uh, an army situation, but it is similar in the sense that you were called in to battle on a very important topic and you executed flawlessly that your other you know, co-founders couldn't necessarily, or maybe didn't have the skill set to, and you delivered on that. And that's very important. And I, I appreciate you sharing your honesty about how you thought maybe sometimes you felt useless, but at other times you really, you know, knocked out of the park and that's obviously valuable. Uh, how involved were you in the Plenty of Fish acquisition? Very. I mean, I, I assume you know, Marcus? We know the story, obviously big Canadian company from Vancouver, Bootstrap. Marcus is obviously a well-known uh, company, but go ahead. And, you know, Marcus and I, 
had known each other through because we were running the two significant free dating businesses. And I, I knew I wanted to buy plenty of fish as soon as I became CEO of Match. And so I flew out to Vancouver one day, uh, see Marcus, you know, walked around, he gave me a tour of the office, took me out to a lovely dinner. And so, you know, I bring up the topic in a way like Marcus is, uh, brilliant, but, and so direct. I mean, he's just so direct. There's no nuance when you talk to Marcus. And so I said to him, Hey, like, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about the possibility of you joining match. We'd love to talk about an acquisition. And he looked at me and he said, Sam, you guys are doing such a great job monetizing OkCupid. I just watch what you do every month and then do the same thing. And he said, so the way I see it is I'm just going to wait a year, watch everything you do, implement it, add some things to it, and then you'll come back in a year and you'll pay twice as much. Wow. And I just kind of left that meeting being like, that's exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> and so sure enough, a year goes by. I email Marcus. I'm like, all right, it's been a year. You've implemented all the things that we've done. Should we get together? And he said, yeah, I'll come see you. So he flew out to Chicago. I took him out to a, a pizza place here. It was actually an amazing negotiation. I, I threw out a number. He said, give me a couple days. He came back with, with another number two days later. And I said, all right, Marcus, do you want to do this the easy way or the hard way? Do you want to like go back and forth or, and blah, 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 or do you just want to split the difference? And he goes, let's split the difference. Wow. And so there you go. Like that, that was the entire negotiation. And we ended up, we ended up acquiring the business. And um, to this day, Plenty of Fish is, you know, is, is a very important part of Match Group and, uh, you know, has continued to grow and is doing some really innovative work, especially on the uh, integration of video into, um, into dating apps. So that ended up being a success. Marcus, un unlike, uh, you know, me, Marcus uh, had no interest in, in joining uh, match. And um, so he stuck around for, you know, 90 days, but he had built a really solid team under him and, um, and the rest is history. Well, it helps that he's the only person that needs to answer that question. <laughs> do you want to do this the easy way or the hard way? <laughs> That's right. That's so right. That, uh, that definitely makes the negotiations uh, a lot smoother, but appreciate you sharing that as well. You know, after your time at match, you took on the role as CEO of shop runner in 2016, after being in the online dating space for almost 13 years. I mean, why did you decide to do a full 180 and move into the e-commerce and shipping logistics space to take on the big, bad Amazon prime? It was complicated. I knew I didn't want to be just the online dating guy like that, that I thought was career limiting. It took, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting industry, but there's still to this day, only half a dozen companies that really matter in the space. And so one of the things that I always look for in new opportunities, and this includes boards that I sit on and um, to some degree investments that we make at, at the fund, I always like to combine something that I understand with something that I don't understand. And so what was interesting about shop runner so ShopRunner is basically Amazon Prime for everyone else. It allows people to get free two-day shipping, free returns at, you know, 100 retailers. The consumer part of that, I totally understood. We had been building consumer products. Yes, mostly in dating, but, you know, ed education beforehand with SparkNotes. We had thought a lot about how do consumers interact with technology in ways that change their lives. And I was fascinated by Amazon, of course, like everyone else. And I was intrigued by... Of course, consumers should want Amazon like a prime like experience everywhere they shop. And so I was, I loved the consumer value proposition from day one. I thought it was a no brainer. The enterprise side was a total novelty to me. I had never sold anything to a company in my life. I knew nothing about the inner workings of retail, e commerce. What do their margins look like? What are their business challenges? How, how are they thinking about competing with Amazon? Knew nothing about that. What I loved about the opportunity was I'm going to come in. I'm going to show up day one. I'm going to totally understand the consumer side of this business. I'm going to be able to, they, they didn't have a mobile app of any consequence. They, I thought there were a lot of opportunities to improve the, the, the consumer experience. And I was going to get to jump in and learn from the team that was already there on the retail side. I was going to be able to learn a whole new business uh, that I thought would just open up a whole bunch of new horizons for me as well. So that was what was interesting. There were some other components. Like I wanted to, um, I live in Chicago matches based in Dallas, Tinder's in LA, okay. Cupid's in New York. And I wanted to do something here in Chicago. And one of the 
one of the deal, one aspect of the deal I made with the with the Sharp Runner board was that I could build the company here in Chicago. Mm-hmm. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. You wanted to change up your skill set and become more of a Swiss Army knife when it came to software and you know, B2B, B2B to C, you know, but it ended up working out well. I mean, it had an eventual exit to FedEx, I believe, for $228 million at the end of 2020. You know, how did it change your views on creating value for other people versus creating value for yourself as a founder, given you weren't the founder of ShopRunner? When I took over ShopRunner, I think there were something like 80 or 90 employees. When we moved headquarters here to Chicago, we probably went down to as low as 60 employees, and then we built the company back up to 220. And I remember when we sold the company, I got handwritten notes. And these are from like director-level people. I got handwritten notes saying, thank you so much. I'm going to use this money to help my mom redo her bathroom. I got a note saying, this goes right into my son's college account. Like people were so specific. I, one person said, I just bought my shop runner house. Like that's, he calls his house, my shop runner house. People were so specific in how their financial success at shop runner manifested itself in their lives. And, you know, I think for so many people, I, I think the story of like equity as it's normally talked about in the, you know, in the press is like, you always talk about the gazillionaire founder, the people who make all, you know, but these are in some cases, people who made a hundred grand, people who made a couple hundred grand, people who made 50 grand. Like it's still so meaningful to those people. And so that's on the financial side. On the non-financial side, I think what I'm so proud of was, I think when you are a founder, culture is very hard to build independent of who the founders are, meaning people work for startups because almost always because they believe in the founders. Sometimes they believe so much in the mission of the company, but those things are often very, very inter interlinked. And so the culture ends up in almost all startups I've seen, the cultures are like extensions of the founders. And I think what we were able to do at ShopRunner because we weren't founders was really sort of think, what kind of company do we want to build culturally? One of the things I'm very proud of is, you know, people who have since left ShopRunner have, you know, written me notes saying ShopRunner spoiled me because I haven't been able to find happiness at any other job because of the culture that that the leadership team at ShopRunner built. So again, it was a whole a whole different mindset and approach to business building when you come in as a hired gun CEO versus coming in as versus starting it as a founder. That's interesting. I mean, first off on the equity side for employees, you know, when we sold our first company to Yelp, it was very heartwarming to hear the ways that the equity that we, you know, were pushing to vest completely on the ac- uh, on the acquisition, which is a hard thing to do sometimes with the acquirer, changed a lot of people's lives. And I still think about all that impact it had. So it must have had a pretty big impact as, on you as well. But also the interesting part of coming in as CEO of a company you didn't found and how your views on culture are so important. You know, we've had CEOs come into some of our companies and it's interesting, their views on culture are just as significant as you are. Kind of like Dara did at at Uber, right? How important it was to change that culture uh, and how he so focuses on culture today at Uber. It's interesting to hear you say that as well as a a drop-in CEO, you know, but I want to get into what you're working on today. So you spent time being the co-founder of Techstar Chicago in 2013 while managing your role at Match. Uh, which you know we'll spend a, a little bit talking about. But you know, after spending time launching Techstars, you and a friend launch uh, Corazon Capital, which means heart in Spanish, uh, as a leading Chicago venture capital fund to help Midwestern entrepreneurs really get access to some of the kind of investors you see on the coast. So can you tell us more about the strategy, about the fund, and you know, how'd you go about deciding it as a you know personal investment vehicle versus a you know external capital uh, vehicle as well? As I said, I was born and raised in Chicago, um, in the Chicago area, and then I spent, you know, the early part of my career and education in Boston, New York, San Francisco. Worked a lot in LA when I was running Tinder, and so I had spent all this time on the coast. So I had seen what these coastal ecosystems look like and feel like. And I came back to Chicago in 2008, and while I saw amazing talent and amazing companies being built, there was no ecosystem. I started the first. I co-founded the first accelerator here, um, which we ended up selling or, or merging with with TechStars. But what I what I found missing here was a venture fund that was really focused on 
adding real value to founders, sort of run by operators. The way I think about it is like, when you're a founder, you have the person or the people you call when something really good, bad, scary, awesome happens in your business. You have that one or two people that are your first call. And I want to be the first call for any founder in our portfolio. That is, that is the threshold. That is the like goal we, we, the standard we set ourselves, we hold ourselves to. And, and most of the venture funds in Chicago hadn't been started by operators. They were, they were investors, which is totally fine. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I thought there was an opportunity to build a fund for founders by founders that would add a value in a different way that could have, for lack of a better sort of way to describe it, just like a coastal mentality, but with Midwestern roots, ethics, you know, values, et cetera. And that was, that was what we built at CoreZone and what we've been building. About a third of our uh, portfolio companies are in the Midwest, about two thirds are on the coast. So we're still very coastally oriented. Uh, my networks are largely on the coast and we, a lot of our deal flow comes from there. Uh, but we do a lot of investing, you know, in, in Chicago and in the greater Midwest. It sounds really similar to the vision I had for starting Ripple, really taking my time living in New York, living in Boston, spending time selling a company to, you know, Yelp in San Francisco, but giving people in, you know, smaller top five cities, let's say, uh, access to those types of value add investors. So it's very aligned with what we have at Ripple. You know, your first fund was a small $13 million fund, which I assume was mostly GP capital, correct? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a lot of GP capital. We had a, it was mostly the way I would call it is just that it was like a friends and family fund. I didn't even there was no fee, no carry. I was just like, if anybody wants to throw some money in, I'm happy to just add a zero on all of my uh, angel checks. I love that. That's awesome. And then you went on to raise a forty million dollar vehicle in 2016, and most recently a hundred thirty four million dollar vehicle in end of 2021. Is that correct? Correct. So how has your fund strategy changed over the last few funds? And, and what would you say your biggest strengths and weaknesses are as an investor? One of the reasons we didn't raise an even bigger fund last time is because I would still want to be able to write very small seed checks. And I think when your funds get too big, you just lose discipline or lose interest in the smaller checks. And I don't ever want to do that. That's what I like. That's what I enjoy doing the most. So I think our strategy of being super early, I want, I want to be able to be early enough that I can build that close relationship with the founder. That's, that's the goal. I think once, once you come in too late, the founder has their people, the founder, you know, that, not that you can't still build relationships, but like it's hard to get as close and build the, tr the level of trust with the founder uh, that I really like. I think our strengths are doing just that of earning the right to be the first call of the founder. I mean, I've gotten calls from founders. Hey, do you have five minutes is the text. You pick up the phone and it's like, Hey, Sam, I'm pregnant. And I was like, why are you calling me? And she was like, I didn't know what else to do. Like that, like, and I was like, I don't know what to do, but she's like, I know, but I figured you would help. And so, you know, we worked through like, okay, congratulations. How do you communicate? How do you know, whatever, it's all going to be fine. But you can imagine that moment when the founder's like, I got to talk to somebody about this. And th that's what I do it for. That's the love of the game is those calls, great accomplishments at work terrible, you know, terrible things happening at work and like just being there side by side. What do we not do well? I mean, I'm a very founder focused investor. And I think there are times when I let my faith and confidence in the founder maybe cloud some clearer concerns with the business. Maybe the TAM's not big enough, or maybe, you know, there's more com competition than I've thought through, but I'm, I'll maybe let my belief in the founder uh, carry too much weight. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, at the stages that we're both investing, you know, it's all about the people and sometimes our judgment of the market <laughs> is not always accurate for better or for worse. But I appreciate you, you sharing that. You know, what's the, I, I've looked at the portfolio. It's kind of, you know, uh, early stage and some later stage, you know, pre-IPO kind of stuff. Like what would you say your sweet spot and, and sector focus would be today? I mean, our sweet spot is consumer. Um, we'll do anything that's consumer. We're, we especially love doing consumer marketplace businesses. There's a company we just, in, uh, two, two companies that are like very top of mind right now. There's a company called Songfinch that's based here in Chicago that allows people to get custom songs written by artists. It's this beautiful marketplace model. They're scaling like crazy. Another company in our portfolio that's, you know, very exciting right now is this company called At Hotel, which is basically trying to build um, an online travel agency on top of social media. Um, and so they've got tens of millions of followers and you can just DM and sort of get your, get really great rates and, and book directly. So those are the kinds of sort of cutting edge 
uh, consumer experiences that really get us very excited. And then in terms of stage, we want to be as early as possible. I, I got to say, say, you're based in Chicago. Uh, how come I didn't see Cameo in the portfolio? Cameo is uh, one of the highest profile companies that has maybe ever been in Chicago since Groupon, probably. One of the challenges with Cameo is it's a, it's a supply constrained marketplace, meaning you can only ever get as big as the amount of supply that you have. And that's an unusual constraint in a marketplace. Uh, constraints typically, uh, marketplaces are typically demand constrained, not supply constrained. And so that was a concern of mine from the beginning was, yes, you, you know, you're doing an amazing job bringing, bringing on this talent, but any talent, any, any person you have of that caliber is only going to do so many cameos either a day or before they just get tired of it and, and, and stop doing cameos. So that was the concern from the beginning was how big can a supply constrained marketplace ever get? They've obviously proven tremendous success. For sure. Uh, I just figured in your backyard, sometimes one of those consumer marketplaces would be right call. Last question, you know, what are some of your personal passions in life that keep you excited about the future, given you've done so much already? As a parent right now, I think, you know, my kids are 9, 12, and 15, and which I think is like this uh, amazing range of ages where they're, you know, old enough to be have really amazing and interesting conversations and young enough to still be at home and, you know, we could see them all the time. So that's certainly passion number one. I think you know, passion number two is is the human side of venture investing, meaning the relationships with the founders outside of the business. Just how can I help the next generation? Like, how can I help develop the next generation of of great leaders and entrepreneurs and play a small role in their development? I, I find that in, incredibly fulfilling. I've been spending a lot of time thinking about like what I want to do next, and uh, that's not really an answer to my passion to, to your question about passion. But I was maybe, maybe the answer is I'm looking for more ways to innovate in the venture space. I think, you know, I, I look at core zone capital today, we have these venture funds and my vision for core zone capital is to get much bigger and not just bigger funds, but more vehicles, more ways to support founders and, and, and leaders and build great businesses. Well, given your background and experience today, I'm excited to see what you guys come up with, but before we wrap things up, we always ask our guests for their fast favorites. So first off your favorite podcast. I'm a huge fan of the uh, show Succession. So the Succession podcast is uh, is a must after every episode. I did not know that existed, and I'm definitely going to check it out. Next is your favorite newsletter or blog. I read money stuff every day as soon as it comes out. Oh, Matt Levine's blog. Matt Levine's. Nice. All right, your favorite tech gadget? I don't know if this counts, but I just got an eight sleep. I love how it makes me feel, and I love all the data that it generates on my sleep every night. I'm dying to get one. I just don't know if my wife will let me. How's the temperature difference between your side of the bed and, and hers? I, I'm I'm a I'm a person of extremes. My wife is a person of moderation. So hers goes from negative one to one, literally during the day. I start at negative ten, the coldest setting, <laughs> and I wake up at positive ten, the hottest setting. So like I, I curl up under the covers when I sleep and I fall asleep instantly. And then I wake up and it's like I'm in a sauna. My and it just like I feel great. So I love it. And it, my side stays very cold and then warm and hers just kind of stays in the middle all day or all night. <laughs> That's usually what I'm hearing from a lot of my friends who have it with their partners. Uh, next is your favorite new trend. I guess this is a thing in San Francisco too. I, I started doing it um, pretty recently, but I have basically been abstaining from alcohol. I feel like that's one of the many like health longevity trends that, uh, that goes right alongside uh, cold exposure and all the other things people are doing. Have you replaced it with anything else? Not really. No, I just have found that like... Um, it's uh, almost always totally unnecessary. Good for you. Uh, next is your favorite book. I love the book Influence by this uh, guy Cialdini. I think a couple times on our during our conversation, I've referenced my fascination with the way people interact with each other with technology, and I just think this book just talks about how to influence people in very um, non obvious and unexpected ways. Awesome. And last but not least, your favorite life lesson. Uh, my mom always said, never give up. I now think of that as sort of like a willingness to fail. Uh, and in fact, not just a willingness to fail, but a realization that failure is a, is a requirement of success. Love it. I actually have a poster in my gym, in my house that says never give up. So I appreciate you sharing that. And thanks for joining us in the tank today with Sam Yagen from Corazon Capital. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for listening to another episode of Tank Talks. To learn more about this episode, be sure to go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify to find more detailed notes on this episode or to check out previous episodes. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review and a rating as it helps us out a lot. 
and hit that subscribe button so you can get notified when new episodes come out. Finally, make sure to give me a follow on Twitter at Maddie B. Cohen or at Tank Talk Podcast to stay up to date on new episodes or to be a guest on our show. Till next time.